Kai Hoi Gromantes. Tone. Parision. Idotes. Hote. SDA. Meta. Tone. Hamart. Tolone. Kai. Tolono. Elogon. Tois. Matetes. Altu. Hote. Meta. Tone. El. Telonon. Kai. Armartalon. Este. SDA. And the scribes, the county clerks. These were the people that were in all of the synagogues. They were the ones that wrote down all the marriages, all the every kind of contract when you traded a pot for a plow or whatever you did, they were there. Okay? These were the ones. The scribes, and we get a word grammar right out of that, grammates, the grammar, grammarians, you know, these are the ones that could read and write. And then of the Pharisees, the scribes of the Pharisees, having seen, look at that, how many for Matthews? Second Irish participle, active, having seen. Having seen and uh, to know with their eyes. Having seen and to know with their eyes that he eats. SDA. He eats. Second person singular, present, indicative, active. He, and he, he eats and he's keep on eating here now. He eats. His habit is eating with meta the sinners. Now, the Pharisees, what does the word Pharisees mean, Brother Roger? Where does it come from? No. Perez, to divide, yeah. to separate. They were so holy, they separated themselves from the rest of the group. To stand apart. To stand apart, yeah. yeah. They stood apart. <clears throat> now, Jesus, this, this Jesus, this so-called prophet, is eating with sinners. And we separate ourselves from these people. We're totally separate from them. And tax collectors. Not only that, but he's, he's having... Uh, how many tax collectors did he mess with? Cindy, you remember? We know of at least two. I was going to say two. But two. I'm not sure. All right, two of them. I'm sure there were others. One of them was a thief and a robber, wasn't he? What was his name? Zacchaeus. 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 All right, and what's the other one's name? Matthew. Matthew. All right, Matthew ended up writing the gospel according to Matthew, didn't he? What was Nicodemus? What? What was Nicodemus? Nicodemus was a rabbi, oh, and he right. was a Pharisee. That's right. All right, and he was in the Sanhedrin court also. And tax collectors, and they kept on saying, or they said, they said, third person throw second error from dignity back to they, this can be in the imperfect tense also. To the disciples. To the disciples. What uh, case is in to the disciples? That's tois mathetes, uh, Cindy. What case is that in? Dative. Dative case. That's dative plural in it. Mm -hmm. To the disciples, how to. Tell me about how to, Cindy. It's genitive, singular, masculine, third person pronoun. Okay. Genitive singular masculine, which is the case of what, uh, Jerry? Um, well, it belongs to them. Yeah, the case of possession. possession. The disciples, uh, and what does mathetes mean? You remember that one, uh, uh, Brother Russ? What about Brother Roger? Lifelong learners. They were habitual learners. They're habitual learners. The learners of him because, and then it says with, Meta, we're in uh, 2.16 at Akata Marcon. Mark 2.16. Because with the tax collectors, look at that, Tolono, with the ta tax collectors. Now, we know that uh, the one of them was very viciously, uh, he was a thief, wasn't he? Zacchaeus. But what happened with Jesus? Uh, met Zacchaeus. 
The first Thank thing's you. out of his mouth, I'm going to give everybody back everything I brought. And, re and I'm going to double and triple the fold, and I'm going to do all of this. I'm going to straighten up right now from this day forward. He said, come and follow me. I'm going to have dinner at your house. All those stolen funds, we're going to put them to use. Amen. The tax collectors and senators are marked alone. Sinners. He eats. He eats. He eats with these people. This is his habit of eating with them. Second person singular, present indicative, active. Estio is what it comes from. Estio. Now number 17, brother. Yeah. When it says sinners, what does sinners mean to the Pharisees? I mean, are they people that never go to the synagogue or never... Or is it lost people? What does the sinners mean to them back then? Well, the tax collectors, many of them, they couldn't go to the synagogue. They were kicked out of the synagogue. But he's saying tax and Mary Magdalene and, sin and sinners. Mary Magdalene, the courtesan, and uh, uh, Zacchaeus. These are really bad people. And then Peter, I'm sure he Peter went to the synagogue, and uh, John and all of them went to the synagogue. But these guys are rough characters that he's dealing with. Uh, a lot of uh, of thieves and robbers. Now in verse number 17, these hamartia. Now what is the word hamartia? What does it mean, Brother Roger? It goes away. It will go out of the pathway. What is the word to miss the mark in Greek? Stokio. Cindy. Stokio. A Stokio. A Stokio. A Stokio. That means to miss the mark. This one here means to go astray. Many preachers, you hear them say hamartia means to miss the mark because Mr. Thayer made a mistake and put it in his lexicon. That's a mistake by the way, in Thayer's lexicon. It does not mean, it does not come from the Hebrew word chata, which means to miss the mark. Okay? The word astokio comes from chata. And, uh, verse number 17. Kai, akusos, ho esus, lege, altois, hote, u, kereon, exusian, Hoi, iskontes, yatru, all, hoi, kakos, ekontes, uk, elthon, kalese, dikaios, ala, amartalos. And then it says here, what about this kai there, uh, Cindy? Kai. It's conjunction. That's a conjunction here. What page is on? 208. Thank you very much. <laughs> You've got an A plus for today. <laughs> All A pluses so far. And an akusos. Now I want you to conjugate that for me. Uh, share. Akusos. <clears throat> Nominative, singular, masculine. First heiress. First arrow. First arrow. Is that a participle? Participle. First arrow is participle and active. Having heard. Don't feel your action. And having heard Hoesus, the Jesus, the Jesus, he says, all right, let's conjugate present indicative active now. How do we do that? Brother Roger, can you do that yet? Present indicative active verb. O S A Omanetti Usian. Let's say that together. O S A Omanetti Usian. Okay, now right here it's O S A. So this one third person singular, present indicative active in it. He says and he kept on saying to them, and that word altois there that is a dative plural, third person pronoun. <coughs> that now that isn't a a bracket, so it's actually not there, but we can understand that it's there, okay? That not. What about this uh, adverb of negation there, Sharon? And that's for emphasis. For emphasis, emphasis, and it actually is action. Not lead. Keep on being not. Not need. This word is not required. It's not absolutely necessary. Necessity they have. Look at that one, Akusan. 
Third person plural present indicative active. The ones strong. Now this word here, uh, vital, helped. Jesus is telling them it's not necessary for a physician to go to the strong people. Now, what physicians try to get you to do today and what the American government has done is to make you buy insurance when you're well, so, you, it, so then you can go when you're, and you're putting, taking care of everybody else that's sick. <laughs> okay? That's what they're doing. Now, here, you didn't go to the doctor except when you needed to go to the doctor. Being strong and mighty, vital, full of vitality. Of a physician. That word physician there means somebody to try to make you well. He's a healer. But the ones, look at that, cockles. The ones that are, uh, and here he uses a kind of weird, a weird word. He didn't say weak, austenia. He didn't say that. He didn't say austenia. He says cockles. What does cockles mean, Brother Roger? Like bad. Bad? Yeah. These guys are bad through and through. You guys are so holy and everything else. I'm only, you know, I didn't come to you guys because you're already, already saying, God, move over, we're coming in. But I've gone to these people that are bad through and through. Having not, I came, not I came, to call righteous ones, but sinners. You know, it's real hard to uh, to tell a man that thinks he's holier than thou that you're wrong and that you need to be saved. It's real hard to do that. It's hard to bring somebody to their knees with the gospel. A lot of people don't like that. You know, I preach hard messages. I really do. Because I'm an uncivilized person. <laughs> And civilized company, I don't want really, you remember, you remember Ken Bland? Any of you remember Ken Bland? They just come to my mm -hmm. class. Not one of you, Marilyn does. Brother Roger, you remember Ken Bland? He's come and, and spoke for me a couple of times. He is a missionary among Mormons now in Utah. Mm -hmm. He was in my class. You remember him now? Okay, he was in my class for about eight years listening to me preach. He went back to Indiana and... Uh, Back there in the, the seminary, missionary, or the Southern Baptist Seminary back there at Louisville, Kentucky, I guess it was, he got up there and started preaching like I preached. And those people like to vacate the house. Scared <laughs> plumb to death. We're holy. Ah, you know, you ungodly buzzard. <laughs> they didn't like that. All right. The Pharisees, they fast. Let's look over here at number 18. Kai, a song. Hoi matete. You know. Kai, hoi. Parasi, hoi. Neis tu ontes. Kai, erkonte. Kai, lagusen. Autu. Dia, ti, hoi matete. Toi. Te, that is. Iwanu. Kai, hoi matete. Ton, parasion. Ne susan hoi de si matete u ne susan. Don't have any water. I'll go get it. Let's look at this. And they kept on being. Look at that. And they kept on being. The ones habitual learners, the ones disciples of John. Look at that. Of John. And the Pharisees fasting. Going without food. And <coughs> they uh, they come for themselves and they say to him, 
why that D and T there means why is it it's kind of a little uh, idiom why because of what is what it literally says but it means why the disciples the learners of John and the disciples of the Pharisees they both have disciples don't they everybody got disciples all have disciples now they go without food and the ones of you your hearers and learners and disciples not they fast they don't fast how come John's disciples fast and how come our disciples fast how come the scribes and the Pharisees and, and the Sadducees and all these people why, don't, why did they fast why did they fast why did these people fast to be outwardly for everyone to see oh so they could look like oh look how holy is he's fasting today he's going around I go, oh, oh, you know, I'm hungry, you know, and all this stuff. You know, he's fasting. Sometimes they fast two times a week. And they sure let everybody know it. <coughs> and 219, thank you, brother. Brother? Now let's see what he says. Kai of pain. Altoi ho Jesus. May dinate. Hoi uyoi tu name funos. In ho ho nepios. Met alton estin. Nace to ain. Hoson chronon. Exusen ton. Nephion, Met, Alton, Hoop, Denetcon, Dinante, Nes, Du, Ain. That's what he's talking about here. Now, later on, what does uh, Jesus call his bride? His church. His church is his bride. His disciples are his bride. Okay? And he's calling them out. And he's courting his bride, to tell you the truth. He's courting her. Now, Christine, when you were going with your husband to be, did you go out and fast together or did you go out and eat? Oh, no, we went to eat. <laughs> <laughs> we you never call you up and make a date with you? We're going to fast together today. <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'd call another friend and go, hey, you want to go out? <laughs> <laughs> well, now, this is the deal. Uh, Sharon, did anybody else ever call you up? Let's go fast today. Any of these boyfriends? No. Evangelina, did Russ ever call you? Let's, let's go out and not eat today, okay? No. Marilyn, she got her mind on food all the time. <laughs> all the time thinking about food. Even when we're finished eating, she won't going to eat the next time. I made a mistake of taking her down, took her down to the Harvest Steakhouse the other morning because it was his birthday, and we had breakfast. Oh, we got to go back there. We got to go back there. We got to go back there. I haven't been there in five or six years. <coughs> Let's just go out and fast. Now, when she goes travels with me, we do a lot of fasting, don't we? Yes, we do. <laughs> Eight hours in between. <laughs> <laughs> no. I just do. Long. I just go. You know. I mean, forget oh, this eating man. business. Let's go. <laughs> you don't want to go with me. I'd have to take her survival kit. I, I, <laughs> I don't think any of you know this, but my doctor is Dr. D. Olin. He had a, he's had a, um, the head of the lab, her name is Sandy, and Sandy's a very close friend of mine, and she used to go to Nevada with me 35, 40 years ago. And we'd go up there, and the first time she ever went to Nevada with me, I took about what would it have been really about 50 pounds of jerky. It was all dehydrated. So it was only maybe 5 pounds or 8 pounds or something like that jerky. And I'm sitting in the seat here, and I'm eating a little bit as I'm going. And I eat to stay alive, don't I, Marilyn? You don't eat to enjoy it. <laughs> I just eat to stay alive. That's it. I'm going. You know, I'm, I'm eating to stay alive. So I won't fall over with low blood sugar or something. That's the way it is, isn't it, Roger? We were going up there, and I think about 14 hours we were driving. 
because I had to go see all of my customers and everything else. She's sitting there with me and like this, and she said, finally we were over in Silver Peak, Nevada or someplace like that. She said, when are we going to eat? <laughs> We've been going since 5.30 this morning. When are we going to eat? This was like 8 o'clock at night. And I said, you've been eating all day. <laughs> you ate 20 pounds of jerky or whatever. <laughs> and I said, well, okay. So we went to the Jack Dempsey room there in Tonopah, I think it was. And we had a fine dinner. <clears throat> People don't say, come and go with me to fast, do they? But the Pharisees did. This was a big deal to them. This was big. Let's go holy. Be holy together. Make everybody think we're going to be real holy. Now let's look at what he says. Kai e pei. And he said to them, Dady plural, third person pronoun, and that's Dady case in it. And that's a third person pronoun. And he says to them, the Jesus, the Savior, the Savior. Hello, Brother Abe. We're in 219 of the Cotamartheon. Cotamartheon, that is, of uh, the Gospel according to Mark. And he says uh, to them, or said to them, the Jesus. And what does Jesus mean? It's actually what in, in Hebrew? Joshua. Huh? Joshua. Joshua. Yeshua. 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 Okay. Yeshua means Savior. Jehovah saves them. Okay. And he says to Jesus, the Savior, not they are able. The sons. Look at that. The sun. Sun. Who is this? This is the heir. The heirs of the bridal chamber. The bride. What does the word bride mean? Do you remember, Chris? What does the word bride mean? I don't remember. Brother Roger, what's the word bride mean? It's nymphonos. What does the word bride mean, Karen? Well, we were talking about this yeah. morning. Okay. That would be the um, the safe play, or sort of like the womb where the conception would be, or the, the bridal bed. The bridal bed. It's a bed. The bride is called the bridal bed. Because she became the bride in bed. Okay? Now, during this, uh, this bridal feast, which is usually how long? A week. Mm -hmm. Seven days. During that period of time, they feast and they eat and she keeps her husband in bed. That's the whole story. That's that's the word here. That's what the word. This is the bridal bed. She, she has her husband in the bridal bed. And that's what it is. The bride's chamber, the, bridal, the bride's bed. In which the bridegroom, Nymphios, the bridegroom, the husband of the bride, the husband of the bed, <laughs> it's literally what it means. With them he is to fast. Do you, is, is, the, is the groom going to fast during his wedding week? No. No. That's not going to happen. Now, they understand about wedding, don't they? What was the first miracle that uh, Jesus did, uh, Brother Abe? The first miracle that he performed publicly. Jesus. Jesus, what was the first miracle that Jesus performed publicly? Cana, uh, yeah. the, the, the marriage of Cana of Galilee. Galilee. Yeah. The marriage of Cana. That was a what? A week-long wedding feast. Now, <clears throat> over here, during the tribulation period, we believe that the, the bride is raptured and all the saved raptured at the beginning of the tribulation period. How long is the tribulation period? Seven years. Seven years. So that is a week of years, isn't it? You understand that? A week of years. Now down on earth, they're having a lot of problems during that period of time. That's when Israel is getting her come up and finally realizes who her Messiah was and, and she slips off and takes off down to Petra, many people believe, and to hide out down there. And in heaven, what's going on in heaven? Are they fasting up there? No. Jesus told his bride there, before he went to the cross of Calvary, as he was taking the Lord's Supper with them, he instituted the Lord's Supper, one of the two 
ordinances of the church, he told them, I will not take this supper with you again until what? I come into my kingdom. When he brings his bride up there, he will eat with them. Amen. And they will eat with him. But he actually... Yes. He ate after the resurrection. The, the yes. On the but that, in that formality, he wasn't. Yeah, and it wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. And that way, it wasn't. Somehow, during the bridal feast, Jesus is going to take that cup and he says, "See this cup. Remember what you remember. See this bread as he broke it. Remember what it up and what it. You know what it reminded you of. That's when he's going to take that with his bride." Now, they are not going to fast, are they? <coughs> and Jesus is making this very plain to them. <coughs> and the sons of the bride chamber in which the bride with them he <coughs> the bridegroom, that is, with them he is to fast. What season, for how long a time, for what, 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 how long a time, they have the bridegroom with them, not they are able to fast. As long as during this bridal feast, they're not going to fast. He said, boys, the bridegroom is here, and I'm calling out my bride. And leave me alone. We're having a good time. We're dating don't tell me to fast when I'm dating my wife-to-be. 2 and verse 20. Lusonte. Kai. Lusonte. Dei. Hemere. Hotan. Aparte. Ah. Alton. Hoi. Or ho. Nymphoios. Nymphios. Kai. Tote. Nisusen. And the kine te hamero. Moreover, we start out with that wicked verse in conjunctive particle day, don't we? It's not the first word in the in the sentence, is it? But that's where we start. That's Greek. Moreover, it shall come days. They shall come days when. I shall be taken away. I shall be snatched away from them. Or I may be snatched away from them. The bridegroom also then they shall fast. They shall fast in that the day. What was the church doing after Jesus was uh, that when Jesus was crucified? Scattered. They were very sad, weren't they? Were they fasting at that time? Probably. Were they fasting? When he was taken from them, before he was resurrected. Those three days were misery, weren't they? Absolute misery. Mourning and weeping and misery. And then he comes back to them, and he comes among them, and what did he? What was one of the things he did there by the Sea of Galilee? What did he do? He ate some fish. He, he cooked fish. He cooked fish and said, come here, come and eat, come and dine. <coughs> 221. Who they? Epi, Blema, Agnapon, Agnapu, that is. Epi Rote Epi Nation Paleon A de Me A Re To Play Rope Ma Up Altu To Kainon To Palio Kai Kairon Schisma Genete. He said, No one, <coughs> no one 
Now, we don't know anything about this today, hardly. This is a thing of the past. I do, because I lived during this time. <laughs> I'm old, you know. Fossil. Antique. Geriatric. <laughs> Mover not one, that's what it says there. It comes from Ook, Day, and Ace. Mover not one. Epiblema. And this here is, <coughs> this means a, a patch piece, a, a, a patch. A patch. Now, a long time ago, still you can buy 501 jeans, can't you? Mm -hmm. That are not shrunk. You have to go buy them, and, and what do you, how big do you get? Whatever size you are, you get like two inches bigger at least, if you want them to fit. You, you take them. Now, when I was young, and the old cowboys, they buy these pants that fit them. And they wore them until they were absolutely slick, and they threw them away. What do you mean by slick? They were so dirty. They were so dirty that they literally washed their pants with them on there. Did, did they do this back in your day, Roger? They did in mine. Those old cowboys up there, they buy them about that much too long. They fold them up underneath because you know what? That was extra padding around those cactus and all that other stuff. And they roll them up underneath and they put them down over their boots and they wear them and wear them and wear them and when they got dirty they just went out there to a, a trough or something and took a rag and wet that rag and just rubbed them down until they got to where they were shiny. They had so much dirt in them that they were shiny. Marilyn, you ever seen those pants like that? Yeah. I wore them like that. Those old cowboys, that's what they did. Until they got holes in them and then they threw them away. If somebody got them, they'd go mm, straight down like that. The guy couldn't wash them. Well, at night, when they went to bed, they just set them in the corner. <laughs> now, that may sound funny, but that, that happened. You could stand them up in the corner, because they were literally stiff as a board. That was the style back then. And they got that from the old cowboys. The old cowboys. <coughs> now, those old pieces of cloth, that heavy, it was what it was, a sail cloth. Levi's were made out of sail cloth and they were sewn with the best stitches and they had brads all over the place, rivets, where they were very strong. They said they were strong as one and only old Levi's that had mule teams or horse teams pulling them both ways. You couldn't tear them up. That was the idea, you know, they're really tough. And you wore them till they were slick and you wore them till they were completely wore out and instead of washing them they threw them away. Because if they had washed them, they would have been too small for them to wear them anyway. Now, if you bought a 501 Levi's today that were not shrunk, they're not pre-shrunk, and you take them, and now this is the only cloth that they had for a long time. This was just what you call unsanitized. How many of you know what the term sanitized means? That means pre-shrunk. <coughs> This is what it's talking about because this is the time. Whether it was wool, cotton, or whatever it was, when you wash something, it shrank down. Some of you don't remember the old uh, uh, Levi's. They used to have stretchers that you put on them so they wouldn't shrink. Mm -hmm. You stuffed them down in the legs and you stuffed them in the waist and everything else. So when they dried, they would keep them from shrinking so much. Mm -hmm. But if you had some, I know, I threw them away. <laughs> Along with them other things. Anyway, if you bought a pair of those 501 Levi's today, and you wore a hole in them, which I have lots of holes in mine, if you wore a hole in them and you bought some brand new 501 Levi's just for patches, and you sewed that on, what would happen? You would tear them. Mm -hmm. That's what it's talking about. You can't put old patches on or new patches on old clothes because they'll tear. It won't work. It says no one patch piece uh, it breaks or bursts of new soles. You don't put old stuff on new and you don't put new stuff on old. Upon the garment, old. Except or otherwise 
a day may, except moreover not. That's what it literally says, but it means otherwise or else. It takes away the, the fullness from its place. And the new of the old, and a worse terror it becomes. It just tears the old pants or whatever up. Now, this is parable of the old cloth and new. This is the parable. What is a parable? Parables, metaphors, hyperboles, taking something allegory, that we can't understand simile. and putting it in our own words. He's taking something that they understand and trying to make a spiritual application to it. Now he goes right into another parable. He goes from that parable to another parable. And of course, we don't know anything about this stuff today. This is beyond our present day understanding because bottles are bottles, aren't they, today? But bottles were not bottles back then. Bottles were skins. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to talk about the parable of the wine skins, okay? Kai udes, bale, oinon, neon, ace, akus, akus that is, paleus, edeme, reze, ho oino, tus, askus, kai, ho oino, apolonte, Apolute, that is, Kai, Hoi, Askoi, Ola, Oinon, Neon, Ace, Askukos, Kionus. Now, the last part of that verse was in brackets by West Scholar Hort. That probably wasn't there, but uh, it's an explanation. Now we're talking about wineskins. How many of you ever seen a wineskin? How many of you have ever seen these sheep herders out there with a, a leather bag that they were drinking out of? Mm -hmm. That's a wineskin. Okay? Now, back in these days, they didn't have glass bottles so much at all. So when they would take wine, they'd take a brand new piece of leather, a brand new wineskin, and they would put wine in it, grape juice, mm -hmm. get them off those taste on blue. Say, get them off those taste on blue. They take this grape juice and put it in there, and they cap it, put a lid on it. And what does grape juice do when it when it uh, starts making turning into wine? It starts fermenting, and what does ferment do? It starts blowing things up. Now, people used to make beer and wine in their cellars, and they put it in bottles, and all of a sudden it's a boom down there. You ever heard those things go boom, Marilyn? Yeah. Brother Roger? You betcha. Yeah, they go boom. They blow up. Now it's glass. They had a, we have a capping machine at home, don't we? Yeah. We got a capper. It was root beer. Yeah, root beer. You sure? It wasn't, that wasn't moonshine, was it? Anyway, uh, you put this bottle out here, you put beer in it or what you're going to put in, and you cap it. You could buy caps back in those days. And you could cap it and had corks in there and it would seal it up and then you put it in a rack and let it set there until it ferments and everything and then you take it out when it's ready. Well, they didn't have those glass bottles or capping machines back then. They put it in wineskins. These wineskins, they would ferment and they would stretch the wineskin. And the wineskins were sewn around the area. Well, stretch it all the way out and then they would take wine, and this is, now this is the custom of the time. Rich people would drink pure wine. Because they could afford it. But the poor, every day man, they would take half of that wine out, and they would serve people on the table and pour water in it. And why did they pour wine in the water, Cindy? You know? To dilute it, to make it last longer. Kill all the bacteria in Kill the water. Kill all the bacteria, yeah. That water over That's there had bacteria yeah. in it, and people got sick. Nobody drank the water. <laughs> when they say go to Mexico, don't drink the water. When you go to Damascus, Syria, don't drink the water. I can tell you that from experience. Don't drink the water. If you drink the water, you're going to get sick. So the best thing to do is put a little bit of 
They put chlorine in water now, tablets and things like that. But back then, they just poured half the glass full of wine, which had alcohol in it, which killed the bacteria. Mm -hmm. And then they filled the rest of the bottle with water, and they kept pouring. These are old wine skins now. They kept pouring water and wine in there. And they put new wine. This is old wine that's already been fermented, and so they could have a drink that was safe. And they drank that, and that's what so many times they drank. Now, you don't take old wine skins and put new wine in it, because what will it do? The wine, the, the wine skin has already been stretched as far as it can go, and if any of you put new wine in it, what happens? You lose the wine, and you lose the wine bottle. Both. So you're defeating your purpose. You got lazy and didn't make new wine bottles, so now you're in trouble. You're going to lose your wine bottles, and you're going to lose your wine. Adame, except it will burst. It will rip and tear. That's the right say. Rip and tear the wine and the wineskins. And the wine, it perishes. It's destroyed. It's spilled out on the ground. And the wineskins, the wineskins are destroyed and the wine is destroyed. But wine new unto wineskins new you put. Here we have two parables. No, but two parables. The parable of what? Don't put old cloth on new clothes or new cloths on old clothes. You can't do that. What's he talking about, Chris? What's he talking about? What's the subject here? What what is he talking about? What's he trying to get across? I guess he's talking about the the law and putting it toward the the new covenant that he's made? I don't know. Is that right? No. Almost. Oh, okay. Almost. How about it, uh, Sydney? <laughs> <laughs> Who had a question? Somebody have a question? No. I, he's talking about his gospel and how you can Okay, now Google let's go back. The, two. the law and the prophets were unto what? John. John. Mm -hmm. Had John already come? Mm -hmm. probably died the law and the prophets runs of John what are they trying to do they're trying to mix the old what was the law for what what was the purpose of the law the point did you huh? the point did you was to lead them to Jesus mm -hmm. the law and the prophets were to lead them to Jesus he is the Messiah he's coming the law and the prophets run to John after that what Judgment. the kingdom of God is preached who was supposed to receive the kingdom of God? The Jews. Who was the one? The Jewish people were supposed to be, they were the sons of the promise. I was talking this morning in the book of Romans. They were sons of promise according to the dirt, according to the flesh. But they lost their chance. They blew it. They threw it away. They were the sons of, they were the heirs of the word of God. They were heirs of the prophets. They were heirs of Moses and of the Levites and the priests. These were all, they were them. These were the ones. But they didn't listen. Jesus came unto who? Everyone else. He came unto Israel. The lost sheep of the house of Israel. Just think about that for a minute. Just think about the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Did the Pharisees think they were lost sheep, brother? Hey, did the scribes think they were lost sheep? No. Oh, who were the lost sheep of the tribe of the sons of Israel? Mm -hmm. These tax collectors that had gone astray, and these prostitutes, mm -hmm. and these uh, scoundrels, the cockos, the bad ones, through and through bad. Those are the ones he came to. Did any of the Pharisees listen? Yes. No. One, two, we know two. That's all we have. And then later on, another one. God had to strike him down. That was Paul. We had Nicodemus that got saved. And we have Joseph of Arimathea that was a Pharisee that got saved. So we got at least three same Pharisees out of all these hundreds that didn't listen, that wouldn't listen, that called for his death. The ones that called for his death. Now how do you apply that law were they supposed to keep on keeping the law? 
No. No. They were supposed to accept their king, their Messiah, their Hamashiach. They were supposed to accept him and listen to him and follow him. And, and then and he gave them all of the, what we call the sample case of millennial blessings. Has anyone, has a salesman ever come to your house? Cindy, you run all off? <laughs> all right. Just open the door with a dog. Just off. open the door with a dog. Come back, come back. That's a real good, th that's, that's good sense, you know. They come to your house sometimes? Sales I've had one. one. You got one? They used to have Fuller Brush. They had the Spice People. What was there called? Uh, Watkins. Watkins. Watkins used to come. The Fuller Brush used to come. And the vacuum cleaner sales. Mm -hmm. The vacuum cleaner sales people used to come to your house. And they'd go in there and they'd say, I want to come in and clean your house up. That's great. Get after it. <laughs> then you get out there after they do all this cleaning and everything else. Then they go out there and they take this stuff out of their bag, sometimes they'll take your old vacuum cleaner and do it, and then they'll do theirs, and they'll, they'll after they take yours and run it over the house, and they take theirs and run it over the house, then they open up their vacuum cleaner and dump all the trash right out on your carpet in the front room. Have you ever had them do that? Not that. Yeah, well, I had, that's what they used to do. Marilyn, did you ever see them do that? They go and, and vacuum your house, they'll vacuum one room or whatever else, and then they go back with their machine and go vacuum over what you mm -hmm. vacuum first with their machine, and they'll take it out and just dump it on the floor, and then they'll vacuum it up. Now, wouldn't you like to have this vacuum cleaner to work better than that thing you thought you had, or that vacuum cleaner you thought worked? And they would do this with Filter Queen, and this do this with Eureka, and they would do this with Kirby. All of these people would come and do this. They would show you what they could do. And the spice guy would whole taste the spice. Smell of this vanilla. Do this, do that. Hey, look, this, the fuller brush man had screwdrivers and hammers and all this kind of stuff. And they'd bring these all out and said, just try this. These are what we call God's sample case of millennial, millennial blessings. That's what he was giving them. Over here in the millennium, <coughs> Israel could have had <coughs> this here. They had to skip the whole church age because it wouldn't listen. God showed them his sample case of millennium blessings. They could have had it. He raised the dead, didn't he? He healed the blind. He cleansed lepers. He raised the dead. And what does it say over there in millennium? God's going to take care of all our sicknesses and everything. They're going to live. Those people are going to live a thousand years over there in millennium. Women can have a thousand kids. You'd really like that when you're married. Now you want a thousand kids. Baseball team. What? Baseball Several baseball teams. <laughs> now these are people that are going to the millennium. That's not us. That's the, the people that go through the tribulation period. They're going to go into the millennium. And they will be in their, in their real bodies. No lost person will ever go into the millennium. These are all saved people. They're going to go into the millennium. And they're going to repopulate the earth. Because five, six of all the world is going to be killed and two-thirds of all the Jews and the Jews are going to be administrators of God's kingdom again except this time they're going to say hey we were wrong we tried to patch up old clothes with new cloths new cloths with old cloths mm. we tried to put wine in wine skins mm. and it just messed everything up mm. because we were wrong they're going to say that aren't they mm. yeah. Amen. they're going to say it they're going to admit that all these days they'll admit these parabolic teachings <coughs> you have any questions? <coughs> I do. You got you got yes, brother. One question. Yes. You said the scribes at the beginning that they wrote down everything. Yeah. All the yeah. Were they paid for doing that? Were they? Well, yeah. That was their. That was their that, job. That was their living. So yeah. That every was time a transaction, there was a fee. Yeah. Everything was a fee. Kind of like today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah so Do you have a county change. clerk? Every word. You go to county clerk. How about well, these notary publics? Mm -hmm. Are they free? <laughs> they were the notary publics of the day. They were the county clerks of the day. Mm -hmm. Any questions? <clears throat> I'm still, I'm still. I heard everything you just said, but I'm still confused. 
what these two parables had to do with what he was talking to them about. It was just... He know. said, you're trying to bring the law into the millennium. Oh. The law is done. The law and the prophets are the John. That's over with. It's over. You're trying to bring one age thing, one rule from one age into another. What are the rules of ethics of the kingdom of God that we try to apply in everyday life which is not applicable? What mistake do we make today so many times? Matthew 5 through 7 is what? And they call it the Great Commission? No, Matthew oh, 5 through 7. Beatitudes. Said oh, the Beatitudes. These are the ethics of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Here and here in the church age between church members. Do you forgive church members? Why? I was preaching this morning. And I said, I, well, I don't think that's why I'm preaching then. I'm making a comment. And I said, church members in God's churches ought to have, have to have a, uh, hides like a rhinoceros, and the preachers have to have Belcar or uh, Kelvar. Kelvar. Ke Kelvar, yeah. Will look for his best. Because, mm -hmm. boy, you're, I mean, this is the way it is. We treat each other in God's churches with those rules. But you go out and live those rules out in the common man life. And you'll be the biggest, biggest laughing stock that ever was. You don't want to. Not out there. That, those are the rules of the kingdom. Within the kingdom. Not outside. Those will be the rules of the kingdom over there in the, the millennial reign. But not today. Not with everyday life. That's not the way it is. So how are we supposed to behave in everyday life then? If we're not supposed to follow We're, we're supposed to be Christians to the outside world. But to each other, we have to apply those rules of the kingdom. Okay? Uh, Sharon. Well, I thought, <coughs> Jesus taught, basically grace. And because we've received grace, it's our responsibility to extend grace. And not, and not distinguish necessarily whether it's a church member or somebody else, but just, you know, forgive because we are forgiven. That's within church members. To the outside world you do that and you're going to be the biggest fool that ever was. The world will take advantage of you. That's why we have courts. That's why we have courts. That's why we have policemen and all that stuff. You have to have because of... You know, we talk about God's churches and sometimes, sometimes people get in churches that aren't saved, don't they? And there's the problem Brother Madden used to say. He said, of all the whores and whoremongers and, and thieves and liars and, and drunkards and everything get saved before they join God's church, it sure would be a lot easier on the church. Because hmm. you got to deal with them sometimes, don't you? But what? That's, that's the church members. Outside the world, you better deal along with the rules of society. You have to, don't you? you can you trust a man by his word? When you're doing making a contract with him, you better have it down. You better go get a notary public. You better get somebody, the bank officer or somebody to sign it, because they won't pay you. They won't. Can we forgive them a thousand times? You can do it. But that's not what it's talking about. I'm not talking about that. That means within God's covenant to people. So is that why I've always been curious about the. Um, the story about when Jesus praised the the guy that was looking after his master's stuff and he knew his master was coming back and was going to fire him. Mm -hmm. And he went out and started uh, making deals with everybody that owed his master for half, cutting these bills down for half. Mm -hmm. And and it you know says that Jesus commended him. But yet, you know, in our eyes, we look at that and we think, well, he's kind of being sneaky. Well, we weren't really. Yeah, he was. He was being dissolved. because you know he was he was going around. He was getting his master's money for only you know fifty cents on the dollar, yes. thirty cents or on the land. dollar, yes. and he was saving his own hide. But you know, in the same sense, Jesus now, what said, do you "Hey, mean by that, he said this is what the world acts like. Mm -hmm. Now, if this is what the world acts like, know how to take care of themselves. Why can't you spiritually apply this to your lives in some way?" He wouldn't, tell them, he wouldn't tell them to go out and do that. <clears throat> he said, look what the world does. Now, if the world can do that, and they can interact, and they can do this, now, why can't you take care of business in church? In your lives. Why can't you do this with your lives? 
These guys are wise. Why can't you be wise? He tells us to be wise as what? Serpents and gentle as doves. All right. These are some hard lessons, aren't they? They're real hard lessons for us today. But you have to realize who is it talking to? What is the subject here? The kingdom had come, hadn't it? The law and the prophets were until John. That's done. Now is preached the kingdom of God. And then what does it say? And everybody by violence presses himself into it. What does that mean? That there's going to be outlaw religions out there wrenching and wringing and killing and murdering. By violence they try to take it by force. Who did take it by force? What was the great uh, uh, ecclesiastical entity that killed 50 to 100 million people? Catholic Church. The Catholic Church. Who else was a, th th those nomads of uh, Ecclesiastium? Muslim world. Hundreds of millions of people that they have killed. Are they taking the kingdom of God by force? Yeah. How do you have to deal with these people? You just turn the other cheek until there's nothing left? What do you do? You fight back. You fight back. You have to fight the world on the world's terms, don't you? I think that's that's some of what's happening in today's world. My mom and I were just talking last night, and they said that we were talking about politics, but I, I, we were talking about, um, you know, like Black Lives Matters and some of these other radical, you know, that are constantly calling us sexist, racist, misogynist, you know, whatever else you want to call us. Yeah. And I think for a period of time it was kind of like Christians were just sitting back saying, you know, at first we were offended by it, and now, I, and then I think it got to the point where it's just okay, whatever you want to call us. And now I think the church is starting to fight back a little bit, yeah. and saying no, no more. You know, with this LGBT stuff, you know, yeah. um, no, no more. We're not, we're not giving in just because you say that's the way it is. That's not that's necessarily not the, way the way it is. It is. Right. That's what exactly the story that that you talked about, Chris. That's exactly well, that's kind of what I thought, because that's what I told my that's kids. I said, I said, that's that's. If you have to deal with the world, deal with the world as the world. Right, and that's when yeah. you're building in Christianity, deal it as with it as Christianity. Right, that's it. Right. Your brother, you gotta forgive him how many times? Seventy times. Seven times seven. Seven times seventy. But the world, deal with him as the world. It's a different matter. It's a whole different group out there. I mean. Christianity has become such a pablum, nothing. And I mean, this is evangelists and things, you know, out in the world. They talk about all this and talk about living like this and, and, and turning the other cheek and everything. Boy, that just gives a, the world the license to kill. Doesn't it? Just gives them the license to kill and abuse you. So what do you do? You treat the world like the world. And you treat your brother like your brother. That's just the way it is. You have the rules of the kingdom and you got the rules outside the kingdom. I know that's what, not what you've been taught all your life. Just wait till Jesus gets home. It's, but it's the way it is. <coughs> that's the way. It, I mean, it's common sense. You have common sense? That's what it says. Common sense. Do you have any common sense? Jesus said to that church, do you have common sense? This is what happened here. Use your brain. Use your common sense. Here, you deal with it like this. How do you how do you mix Jesus telling Peter, how many times shall you forgive my brother? Seven times? Mm -hmm. He says, seven times seventy. Huh? That's your brother. How about the world out there? What do you do? You just let him keep on beating you up or what? You fight back. You're not a victim. You can either become a victim or stand up for yourself one or the other in the world. That's the way it is. If the world does you wrong, then pursue it. If somebody, yes, brother, I think uh, seven times seventy. Yeah. Seventy times, seven times. Yeah, seven. that means that Jesus is talking about uh, me. But I'm thinking about myself, my life. Mm -hmm. This is seven times seven hundred. Four hundred ninety. I got forgiveness. He forgave me. Forgave me. Tons of, tons of times. More than seven times seven. The Lord times. has forgiven you that yeah. way, hasn't he? That he had to forgive me that way. So we have to forgive our brothers that way, don't we? 
I tell you what, I've let my brothers run over me so many times. In church. Just wipe their feet on them. They do that, and that, that's what you're supposed to do. Marilyn, have you ever seen that? You ever seen me do that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, have you seen me do that? Yeah. And I say what? That's what I'm supposed to do. Why would you do that? I say like this, because he's my brother. I have to do that. I have to. But the world, I don't have to do that. Somebody comes in my yard and tells me he's going to kill me, I'm going to shoot him. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the way it is. They're not, they're not, they're not safe. But my brother, I'm going to have to treat him like not my brother. That's the way it is. Any, Carrie, you got any questions? Way too many. Too many questions. <laughs> yeah. Oh. But should well, you, should you, okay. So you're living as the world forces you to live. In the world. Yeah. So, In the world. So are we still required to ask forgiveness for those things that we do that we just go... Dang it, I know I shouldn't have done that, but I had to. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, with the world, there's a lot of times you deal with scoundrels. You deal with scoundrels. I remember, this is rough stuff, I remember when I was pastoring a little church and the gangsters beat my kids up. And I went down there and my co- I picked my son up, he's all beat up, poured whiskey all over him, everything else. I said, who did this to you? He said, those boys. Those boys were in grade school, but they're 17, 18 years old. They're going to school and they're beating little kids up. And they're tearing everything up. So I arrested them. I did a citizen arrest on them, go down there. And I and they came and I said, you're under arrest. I disarmed them. They had chains and, gun, and knives. I had a gun in my pocket and tell them that. I just physically disarmed them. And they were big kids. I took them down and arrested them. Had the sheriff come out. And this was in a barrio. This is really bad. These are gangsters. They are gangsters. They don't learn. They don't know how to read and write. They hurt people. That's what they do. So I arrested them, and I told them, I want you these people arrested. Look what they did. Well, they said, one of those boys is under 18. What the other ones weren't. Because here they are going to school, grade school, and they're beating all these little kids up. He said, they want me to arrest you, but we're not going to do it because you were protecting your rights and everything else. And they attacked you. They attacked me. They came at me with chains and knives. I took them away from them. And then I'm standing down there. He said, what are you doing? I'm a pastor of that church down there. So I do like this. Well, you were really a rough guy. <laughs> you know, to arrest these kids and do all this kind of stuff. And I said, yeah. I said, I'm just protecting my rights. I'm not a pansy. I said, they're not going to do this to my children. And so they threatened to kill me. And I said, well, I live over there underneath that big antenna. If you want to come over there, that's where you'll be. You'll be dead there. Yeah. And they said, you're threatening my son. I said, I didn't tell them to come over there. They said they were going to come kill me. Mm. I said, they come over there, I'm coming out shooting you. And I did. And that was all of it. It was over. I went out shooting. They got, I got them. They didn't get me. Mm. That was over. It was all over with. Mm-hmm. Because then they found out that I am not going to take this. When I walk down the road, they take off running like rats in the light. From that on, it didn't happen anymore. No more. And they learned. <laughs> Some of them got saved. Some of them went to prison. I was, I had rules that I followed by and I expected society and I expected them when the cops says, boy, you don't do this, I'm going to do something. It's rough. But you can either become a victim in life or you can be stand up for yourself one or the other. It's rough sometimes. As Christians, we have to remember though, because you can get lost in the world and dealing with people and, and things like that and you can forget who you are and who you represent because there's always going to be times where you can put Jesus out there mm-hmm. to the world. Yep. But you can get caught well, up. Did. You can get caught up in the world and forget that you've got to do this and you'll miss your opportunities. Yep. Yeah. So you've got to remember and, and like Cindy was saying, okay, I've dealt with the world this way and when I go home, I pray about it because, you know, to God, you know, what I'm trying to do or supposed to be, I did something <coughs> maybe that's wrong, but that way you can stay focused and remember that you're a Christian and yeah, well, be told, able to... I said, I am a Christian, but you won't walk on me. I think part of the, part the, of the problem yeah. that, that we have, and, and me too, not, not 
so much, but I think a lot of people do, is that we view Jesus as so um, mild and so um, just kind of like this forgiving, walking around, loving everybody, <coughs> let's pass out d days, you know what I mean? They always, they always make Jesus out, out to be... This something he isn't. Something he isn't. When you when you start reading there scripture, there is a real hell. Yeah. Well, when you start reading yeah. scriptures, you you see that he's pretty. He tough. talked more about hell and damnation mm -hmm. than he did about the kingdom. Yeah, and he's pretty yeah. tough with these people mm -hmm. that that refuse to believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's not he's not sugarcoating stuff. He's no, calling no. them out. He's he yeah. and 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 we forget that these disciples they were packing. And he told them to do what. <laughs> Go get you a knife, a right. sword. Go, go arm yourself. Yeah, go arm yourself. But I think a lot of that is, is too, you know, you don't want to give people a false perception of the church. Right. Because they'll use it, they'll turn right around and use it against, against you. you. Right. And, and say, what would Jesus do? <coughs> right. Well, right now he'd kick your butt. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know? He'd hang you. He'd crucify you. That's what he'd do right now. <laughs> but you always... Do you ever cuss when you get mad? I mean, yeah. I mean, you might do that, but you don't. Yeah. Okay, you don't do that. I never did that. I call them everything but good and never use a bad name. <laughs> I told a man off one time that did a dirty deal to me, and my ex-wife was sitting there listening to me, and she said, you know what? You were mad. And you called him everything under the sun, but you didn't call him one bad name, but you told him all those things that he was. She said, I never saw anything like it in my life. You told him off. The truth. Flat. I called him everything but good. I called him, you are a liar. You are a, a fraud. And all of this. And I said, you intentionally deceived me to take advantage. I said, you're the scum of this earth. You're the kind of trash that they take off to the dump. dump. You were trash. I said, don't you act like you're a human to me. I said, you're nothing. You know, like that. And <laughs> I told him all. Because he needed to tell him all. And I fought him hard. It cost me $10,000 to go to court, and I just beat the tar out of him in court. Mm. But uh, anyway, we won. Spiritually, and in the laws of the land. Mm -hmm. Both ways. That's the way you got to do you got to be above reproach in so many ways and yet stand your ground when you have to. Mm -hmm. Don't be a pansy, as they say. Stand your ground when you have to. And that's what those parables are about. That's the parable that confuses you about the guy going out and doing these terrible things. And then Jesus commended him. He said, no, that's what the world does. Think. Use your head. Mm -hmm. Have some horse sense, some common sense in what you do. Okay, just use common sense. Sometimes it's a hard commodity isn't it, to come by. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Especially when you want to think like a Christian, you still got to use common sense. You know, uh, churches, they're, they're church bombs. Did you know that? Church bombs. You know what a church bomb is? As somebody comes around and bombs off the church and takes money and this and that, and they go off, they will go to these giveaways and they'll take that and go and sell it for drugs. They'll take the food and sell it to drugs or gambling debts or whatever. They will do this. They'll go down there and I know a person very personally goes down there. She's nothing wrong with her, but she goes down there with her walker going like this. So she can get in the elderly line and then she goes up and then she goes out and dances and bowls and everything. Mm -hmm. Hopping around. But she's doing like this. <coughs> That's dishonest, isn't it? They check up on those things, and if somebody, if if they're uh, misusing rules, the churches will prosecute them. Valley Baptist Church, they got it, somebody that investigates it before they ever give them anything. Mm -hmm. Because they're church bombs, people take advantage of church people because they think they're passes. They're an easy mark. Don't be an easy mark. Amen. Help somebody when they really need help, but don't be an easy mark. Had a guy come to my house one time and wanted me to give him money so he could get drunk. That's exactly what he wanted. He's honest. <laughs> no, he didn't tell me that. Oh, okay. He didn't tell me that, but that's what he wanted. He was on a drunk and he wanted more money. He comes to my house. He said, you're a preacher, you're a pastor. I need money. Give me money. I said, no. You're not doing what you're supposed to say. I said, I'm not a pastor. I'm not stupid. 
I said, go with somebody else. You're not being a Christian. I say, I'm not going to help you get drunk. Mm -hmm. I said, you come back when you're sober, and I said, I will help you, but not when you're drunk. You're going to go get more drunk, and you're going to stay drunk. That's it. You know, the Alcoholics Anonymous, boy, they are really rough on each other, aren't they? How many of you ever dealt with those people? Mm -hmm. Hey, hey. There's somebody comes in there and really wants help. If he's been there four or five times, they take him out of here. Fight with him. Mm -hmm. He don't want help. He needs to be down in the gutter first. Let him go a few more steps down in the gutter, and then he can come and we will help him. But right now, forget it. Mm -hmm. These drug abuse programs, how many times have they been through this stuff? They're rough on them. Because they're using the system. Yeah. yeah. Remember the, the guy, able bodied guy, walked up to you and wanted money. And you told him to go get a job. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I got a brother that's a panhandler. Go get a job. He looked at me like that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do well with that. I work too hard in my life. Amen. I work too hard in my life. I'm, I'm, I'm crippled up and I work too hard. I work hard anyway, don't I, Chris? Even though I'm not able, I do it anyway. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? We went way over. I was going to teach you Second Corinthians if you wanted a, a little short class in Second Corinthians, but we went too long on this one. All right. Anything to answer all your questions? I won't be there Monday and Tuesday because right. yeah. I'm going to just like that. Anything else? I have one question. I'm yes. thinking about this week. <coughs> uh, Genesis one. It says, according to. What you tell us with the uh, translation, in beginnings is the way it should be read, correct? Yes, in beginnings. So, Actually, in one of the beginnings. So, in John, is it the same way? First John, where. No, it, in, that's in, in the beginning. In, in the beginning, beginning, singular. So, you're not talking the about the existence of God. The in the beginning, beginning, absolute extremity, in both in eternity past, as far back as you can go, He kept on being Jehovah. Amen. Okay, that's different. So we went through uh, 216 to 216 through uh, 23. Yeah. That's pretty good. <laughs> we went far enough, didn't we, Cindy? No. Nope. Mm, yeah. Okay. Kind of, sort of. I yeah. think almost okay. <laughs> <laughs> almost okay. You want to dismiss us in prayer, young lady? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we have together. We consider it so precious to be able to study your word and, and get a greater understanding of exactly what you have and what your